Welcome everyone to this iteration, starting off our new fiscal year for Voices of the Future. Our theme this year is the future at stake because things are getting much more intense as to what our future is gonna be like. And we like to have people who are talking about ways of healing, healing democracy, healing people, healing the financial system, making a better way to live for all of us. So we're kicking this off with Lori Leiden, PhD, she in MBA. She's intimately acquainted with trauma and has dedicated her life to healing your own, healing her traumas and developing a most elegant healing method possible. As an internationally hailed trauma healing pioneer, transformation transformational leader and visionary spiritual mentor, Dr. Layden has been called in to work with traumatized communities who experience genocide, war, and school shootings with remarkable results. Hats off to you for the places you've gone. She's a member of the Evolutionary Leader Circle, along with Michael and I, and the Association of Transformational Leaders, as well as an evidence-based EFT master trainer. And we're having her on because in one week on 914 next Thursday, uh, her new book is coming out, Embodying Grace, Trusting Yourself, Your Life, and Your Divinity, which is about healing from trauma and opening to the divine wonder that is our life. And you can get it on Kindle for $1.99 on that date. We want people to go there so she can get a bestseller sticker and put it on the print version when it comes out. So <laughs> welcome, Laurie. We're really happy to have you here. Oh, thank you so much, Anadia and Michael. Um, you know, we have enjoyed many beautiful conversations together, and I'm, now I'm excited to, to to talk about our work together uh, to your audience and this this notion of the future at stake. Wonderful. Well, your work with trauma, certainly if we don't heal trauma, we're not going to have a healthy future. And so tell us how you got into that. What's your backstory about <laughs> combining trauma healing work, spiritual mentoring, all the different things you've done? How, how did you begin? What's your story? How much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, we have a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we want to make it succinct. <laughs> well, we also want to know who yeah. you are. Yeah, the short story really is that I got into this work because I had a desire to heal my own childhood traumas. And uh, I began at a very early age uh, to explore how to get out of the pain that I was in, to try to understand the trauma I was experiencing, uh, to try to get out of the sense that I felt so alone and separate. Uh, and so as a result of that, um, as I like to say, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on every form of healing known to man, woman, and extraterrestrials, <laughs> um, uh, and always in search of what is the more elegant way that we can heal. And so that's been my journey. And what I've come to over the years is understanding that we have two purposes in every lifetime. And that first purpose is to heal the wound of separation from the divine, which I believe is our primary trauma, which every other human trauma arises from that separation from the divine. And then the second is that once we get on that path of healing with the divine, 
we uh, and we heal our traumas i think that the seeds of our destiny begin to emerge because we allow that passion to flow once the trauma has been uh relieved or released and then we are in the beautiful place of being here to find our own personal expression of our unique divinity so those two purposes set us up for this lifetime and I know it sounds esoteric when we're talking about economics and democracy and so many other things, but to me, especially working in these very traumatized communities, it has proven over and over and over again the resilience of the human spirit. And when we can feel safe in our bodies, mm -hmm. that is the beginning of healing. Uh, Beautiful. Yeah. So, Laura, we, we'll have a lot to talk about your book, <laughs> your, your work, um, both in um, overseas in Rwanda, Africa, the United States, and the um, school shooting communities. But but to talk, let, let's address um, trauma a little more first, so we can kind of lay the foundation. So you speak about um, finding the seeds of our destiny and healing our trauma. So I'm wondering if you could um, elaborate on that some more. Yeah. I think that requires me to talk about um, the heart brain body connection, which very few people, I think we're, we're talking a lot about the vagus nerve and the opportunities with the vagus nerve now. But what I've known for 30 years or I've experienced is that physiological regulation is the key to our healing of trauma. And that what many people don't understand is that trauma is a brain, creates a brain-based dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And until that brain-based dysfunction is somatically released, the circuits in our brain and our heart and our uh, body are not optimized. And we can go into the whole work of the Heart Math Institute. And of course, Anodea has so much background in this as well. Uh, but we're learning from heart math that the first organ in the body uh, to form is the heart. And the heart has its own brain, which has neuronal cells, basically brain cells, that are exactly the same kind of neuronal cells in our prefrontal cortex, which is the seat of our highest human gifts intuition, creative problem solving, connectedness, a sense of transcendency, uh, a sense of peace and safety. And, and so morality when, too. Absolutely, absolutely. And that inner wisdom tunes us into whatever we need in the moment. But if, if that heart brain body connection is not functional, then you're running stress hormones all the time, which is interrupting your ability to be in your highest human form. And because of this heart brain body connection, I believe we are heart wired for divinity. Hmm. Uh, and I talk a lot about that in the book. And so when people realize, oh my gosh, if I regulate my physiology, which sounds like a strange thing to be focused on when you've just experienced some horrific tragedy or you're still living with childhood trauma. But what we see with uh, emotional freedom techniques slash tapping and the grace process is that people can come to a place of inner safety very quickly. And once you're in the inner safety, then you can explore what needs to happen for people to heal. Um, so that I don't not sure if I answered your cor uh, question correctly, but the heart brain body connection and physiological regulation is key to personal healing. And I believe global healing. Beautiful. So rather than the gut brain, which is what is we're actually going to a higher center. You know, I work with the chakras. So the yes. heart is a higher center than the gut. And the gut does have its its use, but it's a more primitive place, and the heart is a more connected place, and the heart connects to higher source. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. So you see that the healing of trauma is also a spiritual awakening. It is so profound. If I can work, even in my with my own personal traumas, which have nothing, no comparison to the communities uh, that I work in. 
um, when you can bring somebody to a place of inner safety in their bodies in an hour, everything is possible. And I have many beautiful stories about that in these in these places. Uh, but we don't understand. And you know what? I think your listeners will appreciate if we just ask the question, when were the times that you ever felt perfectly safe in your body? It's an elusive thing. Um, and so then to have the confidence that I can bring myself to physiological regulation, I call it, um, you know, the medicine is in our fingertips because using our tapping, we can release the flow of endorphins. Um, and so that we have all the medicine we need right in our own bodies. Uh, but these are the th these are the these things are not being spoken about in terms of trauma healing, and they're so basic. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when I'm so excited that the world is ready for this. When I see people talking about the vagus nerve and trauma is the new buzzword, yeah. um, which is fine. But now we, it's nice to talk about. And we've talked a lot about trauma informed in the literature. That doesn't mean anything unless you have trauma healing skills. Mm -hmm. So to say that you're going to create a safe environment, to say that you have some philosophy about being trauma informed doesn't cut it without having the somatic release skills mm -hmm. i totally agree and i know just a sec we'll go back to you michael but just to you know dovetail on this uh, a word in your book came jumped out at me because it's been my philosophy my whole life the spiritual journey is all about embodiment because I think we think the spiritual journey is about getting up to our heads and getting out of our body and getting into the cosmos. And I have taught all my life that no, the awakening occurs in the body and it's an embodied experience. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. And I'll just say this because I like to say that the time, you know, stop your spiritual practices now. And people go, what, what do you mean? And my feeling is if you're doing your meditation in the morning and you're on the yoga mat and you do your journaling and then you get off the mat and stop the journaling and you kick the cat or yell at your partner, you're not embodying your spiritual practices. So, of course, please continue your spiritual practices, but really take note. Are you living them? Is your, physio is your physiology allowing you, is it regulated enough to allow you to live those spiritual values? Mm -hmm. that, that's a good point, Laura, and it speaks to the whole concept of um, spiritual bypassing. And, and in that regard, in your book, in the introduction to your new book, Embodying Grace, you say, and I'm quoting you, much of what passes as spiritual growth is really spiritual entertainment leading to spiritual bypass, using our spiritual ideas and practices to rise above, deny, or distract us from unpleasant emotions, experience, and reality, uh, realities. Um, can you say more on, mm. on the concept of spiritual entertainment, spiritual bypass? That was, that was really a fascinating thought on your part. Well, I like to be a little provocative from time to time, uh, but this is what I've seen. And that is like, I am thrilled that the growth of self-help books and spiritual gurus and, and you know, it's, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, which is brilliant and wonderful that people are focused on their spiritual growth. Uh, however, some of what's out there is lacks the substance uh, to allow us to embody the work. There's a philosophy out there about law of attraction, and I, I, I have no problem with law of attraction, except for how some people are teaching it and some of the basic tenets that are not being addressed, which a lot, for example, I work with people with uh, terminal illnesses from time to time, and there is this, I know that we need to go deep um, into those emotional wounds and the spiritual wounds, but because of other things they've read, they are afraid to deal with negative emotions. And and for me and the work that I bring and present uh, with EFT and the grace process, you can honor whatever emotion is arising in a place of safety 
so that you can deal with it and get the wisdom from it and not feel unsafe when those memories come up and the or the thoughts come up um and that being safe with the truth of what is that you're experiencing in the moment is so important and if we anger quote unquote neg anger is not a negative emotion fear is not a negative emotion when it is healthy it just is giving us a signal oh i need to set a boundary or oh i need to protect myself but we need to heal our relationship with our emotions in order to really do this deep spiritual dive work emotions are actually a reaction to whatever is going on and when trauma is occurring there is a huge reaction in the physiology and the emotional body and the mental body and all the various bodies that is oh my god you know whether it's a repeated trauma or a once trauma and my understanding from training i've done in trauma is that what arises does not get to complete in a traumatic situation so what arises is get away from me stop or help or you know crying out or whatever it doesn't get to complete and that's part of what gets stuck and disrupts the physiology and the energy body and dysregulates our nervous system and let me just explain that very simple terms could we could spend a lot of time on this which is for me i look at how trauma affects two organs in the brain one is the amygdala and one is the hippocampus so the amygdala is the smoke detector in the brain and this is the thing that sends an alarm into our body uh, to say you're not safe protect yourself or you're safe you can relax now in trauma uh, and, and then the hippocampus is the memory center so the amygdala and the hippocampus are in communication all the time and during trauma um cortisol ster steroids and adrenaline interrupt that communication between the amygdala and the hippocampus and so what the techniques that i teach help us feel safe in the presence of memories without the physiological flooding or reaction and the reason i take a moment to describe that is i really want people to understand that this is physiological and it's science based even though and i can't the original question is about connecting with our spirituality and unless we're fully grounded in our bodies because our bodies are the perfect vehicle for this human experience um we can't have that spiritual connection that we came here to explore in my opinion mm -hmm. yeah um how do you in, in working with people i have two interrelated questions in working with people how do you help them get past um any sort of um um work that leads to narcissism when they're just stuck on themselves so much and then secondly, um, we know so much, you know, we talk so much about post-traumatic stress disorder, but um, I don't know if it was Pema Chodron or Buddhist psychologists talk about post-traumatic uh, growth. Mm -hmm. So um, if you could, um, you, know, you know, the narcissism and then how do you get people to go towards the growth factor, not being, not, 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 un not talking little, not, not making it sound like, oh, that's nothing, post-traumatic stress but to get them to go beyond that yeah um let's book narcissism for a whole nother show <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that you're right that is a big conversation it is a big conversation but but having said that i mean i understand what you mean uh but here's the bottom line when we are physiologically regulated that's where post-traumatic growth and resiliency emerges and the simple answer is you got to do the work to regulate your physiology first then the resilient the resilience i mean i see it in one session a 50 minute session uh and of course through all of these different communities i've developed protocols specific to these circumstances that allow relief quickly now when i say that when you when you've lost a loved one through violence 
it's a lo- it's going to be a long process but the sooner we can establish physiological regulation and safety the sooner we have a path to healing and so when you regulate that heart brain body connection and if you have the right practitioner who has the right detective questions um it's up so the practitioner is only a detective it's all it's what the content that the client has that's the most important thing so i don't know the answers the client knows the answers and all i do is hold space with the right well with an appropriate proven protocol that allows them to feel safe enough to tap into their own inner wisdom so at the end of sessions we're talking about insights they've had about their own i don't set tell them what the answers are they're having that experience of that heart brain body optimization where they just have these ahas and insights that allow them uh not to attach the trauma to the memories and also then to be able to look at and i say this very gently and tenderly what's possible mm-hmm. moving forward what's possible for the future absolutely i call it following the charge and that the charge from the trauma we get increased charge when trauma is happening and then it gets blocked and stopped in the body but that charge has an intelligence and it is wanting to take that person to freedom and i would agree toward merging with the divine mm-hmm. well i wanted to you know you're doing heavenly work often at the gates of hell <laughs> or maybe in <laughs> hell itself and you have gone into some really really stressed communities and can you talk a little bit about some of the places you've taken your work so yeah. we have an idea of the breadth and depth to which you've gone mm, thank you um I was in private practice as a trauma therapist um and then uh in 2007 I received a an email asking if my first book the stress management handbook could be translated into Kenya Rwanda and for people who don't know that is the language of Rwanda and in 1994 I was deeply deeply <clears throat> Uh, traumatized myself to see another gen yet another genocide occurring in the 20th century uh and so when i got that email i just knew i felt this quickening that something of destiny had arisen and of course i said yes and then i said and, and they and i said uh, and what else can i do and they said please come here and teach here trauma healing skills to our widow and orphan head of households um orphan head of households are children who were 6 to 8 years old at the time of the genocide and given you know two to six other children to raise with no visible means of support or anything like that um and so that rwanda was the beginning and uh, and i i will we can bookmark for a second about how i prepared myself to go to rwanda which is really the essence of this book embodying grace um the preparation i did uh and then from there i just well i had a near death experience in 2003 and at that point i said i would follow my heart wherever it led mm-hmm. and 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 it's led me to all these places and so i always ask what is mine to do rwanda was a huge yes which now how many 16 17 years later and 18 trips 20 trips later you know my heart is in rwanda uh in 2000 in 2012 i received a call about the sandy hook elementary school tragedy from one of my biggest donors nick ortner of the tapping solution asking me what would i do uh if if i came to newtown and we're talking about 2 hours after the the event occurred and i said well i would do the same thing i did in rwanda which is set up a community based program and teach rwandans or newtowners to heal other newtowners which is a huge part of humanitarian effort i believe which is i come in with my skills but i don't know the answers 
I need to partner with the people on the ground and create community and safety so that together we partner in what it is they need to heal. And so three days later, I was on the ground in Newtown and I thought I was staying for three weeks. I stayed for three years. We built a beautiful, beautiful healing community there with volunteers. Um, in the meantime, I was called to Australia um, and that's another story because I I always ask what is next on my life path and the plight of indigenous people and refugees was weighing deeply on my heart and in fact had a conversation in 2015 with Barbara Marks Hubbard about this very thing and shortly thereafter I get a call from people in Australia um, inviting me to come there and do this work in Aboriginal and refugee communities. Uh, from there, I went on to Parkland, the scene of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, High School shooting and spent two years there before COVID uh, kind of interrupted that. And um, I've been trying to do mentoring and, and certifications online uh, since then. Um, but yeah, those are the places I've worked in. But let me just say this, I receive so much more than I give. I do not feel like I'm going into the heart of darkness I, because I'm, I'm seeing the resilience of the human spirit and heart. And, you know, I have this analogy, this metaphor that, um, you know, healing is like an infinity circuit where there appears to be a giver and there appears to be a receiver. But when we meet in the sweet spot in the middle, there's only love and we're all transformed. So I owe, I think of every person I work with as my healing partner. And mm -hmm. what I've, I don't, I do have some explanations for how my childhood prepared me for all of this. But at the same time, I'm in wonder, like mm -hmm. that I get to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and so let me just say this also, really important. It's how we prepare ourselves to be in service that mm -hmm. makes it is how we prepare ourselves to be fully present in our hearts, which allows the healing resonance to expand. And so the greatest work that I can do is mentor other people um, to be fully present in their heart so that they can go into these communities. So many people want to be of service, but they're not ready. They're not prepared. Um, and so it, it takes some deep work to look at your own shadow work, to look at, for example, if you come to Rwanda, can you sit in front of a woman whose family was massacred and she's left tortured and living with AIDS? Can you sit with a mother whose child has been murdered? Can you sit, you know, what happens in you internally? That's the work that I do to prepare uh, people in the mental health profession. And what I did myself which made all the difference, made all the difference. Wow. That's powerful, Lord. <laughs> I have to take a moment just to like um, catch our breath on just what you said. Um, I'm putting the link to the documentary um, on Rwanda, your work in Rwanda. Um, but but um, I'll, I'll multitask here. You, you talked about that you had... Um, um, from your work in Rwanda, you had some of the people in Rwanda help also mentor, counsel some of the people, the traumatized community in Sandy Hook. So I wonder mm -hmm. if you talk about that and yes. here's the link to the documentary. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I think it was the third trip back from Rwanda. Uh, you know, it's a nine hour time difference and uh, the jet lag can get you. Uh, and it was the third trip. And I remember I'm up at three in the morning and I, for some reason, you know, I'm watching like crazy Turner classic war movies. And I, my heart just was breaking because I was like, this can't still be happening in our lifetime. Um, and anyway, I said, how can we heal this? What's going to happen? And I would doze off and doze off. And I started to receive this information about a new form of humanitarian work, which I call Project Light. And Light stands for um, heart-centered leadership, uh, um, 
<laughs> now I forget that, uh, inspires global healing and transformation. And the notion is if we can heal our traumatized young people who will be our next generation of leaders, if we can heal them to become heart-centered leaders, to have economic sustainability um, and know how to do that trauma healing work, they can lead us into a peaceful future. And my vision was to have these project light centers all over the world uh, where young people who had learned healing could communicate with other people around the world to inspire them. Knowing that young people don't want to talk to adults who are going to preach at them. Um, they want to talk to people who have experienced what they've experienced. And we didn't have funding. We had enough funding to run Project Light uh, Rwanda which produced these 12 Project Light ambassadors that I have since adopted. Uh, I had 12 and now 13 grandbabies. Um, uh, and they have continued the work in Rwanda, um, gone into their communities, done the trauma healing work. And I told them that they were gonna be ambassadors of light for the world. <laughs> and I thought, can I really be telling them this? <laughs> And then it was just uh, a year later that we're in Sandy Hook, and I'm realize I see this young boy, JT, who you'll see in the documentary, who's having a really tough time because his six-year-old brother was murdered, um, and I, nothing was getting through to him. And uh, EFT tapping, he was like, "Oh, please, you people, that's ridiculous. I'm not tapping on anything." Um, I said, well, would you like to speak to some of my uh, kids in Rwanda who've gone through something similar? And we set up this Skype call and I watched for an hour and a half um, as a 12 year old boy with a, Ru a Rwandan translator spoke to two of my ambassadors. I never told anybody what to say or how to say it. They just communed together for amazing results. And uh, and the next day, JT announced that um, he was going back to school and he was going to start a, a, a funding program to send my Rwandan kids to college because we should all be, we should all help people who have experienced worse trauma than we have. That's from a 12 year old. And so my notion, and at that moment, while I was watching the Skype call, I finally realized, ah, this is Project Light. I mean, now we have, we're in communication like this. And it was much kind of in a smaller scale than I had hoped, but life is not over yet. And we've had other experiences in other communities that are growing this model of trauma healing, heart-centered leadership, and economic sustainability. And that's what the documentary is about. Yeah. Oh, so I put the link in the box so anyone can get to it. The chat box. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um, you know, in reading your book, I you list 19 core truths of healing. And I won't go through all 19, but the very first one really struck me that our greatest human gift is choice. Now that's not something you would expect people to say is the greatest human gift, but maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit. And also what trauma does in restricting our ability to choose. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, exactly, exactly. Um, and so if you, Think of choice as, you know, in certain religions, they talk about free will. We were given free will. I consider that to be choice. Um, when I was having my near-death experience in 2003 uh, and I was floating out of my body, I heard these words in my head saying, everything in life is a choice, including taking the next breath. And I remember just being like, well, I can't just choose not to take the next breath. But I remember thinking, well, I've had a great life and I've helped people and oh, this isn't the way I thought it would end, but okay. Fast forward, uh, I did take the next breath and there's a funny story about that. However, 
I was then back in my body in a lot of pain. Um, and still in the wonder of if everything in life is a choice, what do I do next? And the message came, you have to follow your heart. Mm -hmm. So the other piece was that I also revealed, re re understood that receiving was something that I could not have done before because of my trauma. Trauma blocks our ability to receive in healthy ways. And so that's what I have been in the research of in the last 20 years um, is that level of choice, following my heart and meaning from a grounded, healed way. Uh, and even if you think that everything in life isn't a choice, our response to life is a choice. And when we heal the trauma, we have the resiliency to respond to what life presents us, which is what the, the subtitle of the book is about, trusting yourself, your life, and your divinity. Yeah. Um, I, want to, I want to just go, I have a question. I want to go back to, not to belabor it, but the school shootings. I mean, you've, you really, I mean, it's just amazing the work you've done, sadly, that you've had to do with um, you know, Sandy Hook and Parkland. Um, and, and sadly, this is school shooting, shootings, mass shootings are, are becoming a way of life in America. So is there thought, whether your thought or you talk to others, what it is, what is the brain, the traumatic brain experiences or whatever that drives the individual who, who perpetrates this, this par? Um, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. well two things really look uh there's no perpetrator on the planet who hasn't been traumatized uh and it's all in an effort to find safety somehow somewhere it's all an issue of separation separation from the divine separation from your immediate family separation from your a sense of belonging in the world and in your community um, and our political systems, our, our educational systems, our mental health systems are not prepared to deal truly with healing trauma. Hopefully we are in an evolution now where people understand, will begin to understand the physiological reset that's necessary. Part of my work is to evolve the mental health system into understanding that current forms of cognitive therapy are inappropriate for trauma um, and end up further traumatizing people. So um, so let then let's go back to, because it can feel like a really overwhelming thing to try to answer this question. And that what it puts people into a sense of hopelessness when they see all this chaos. And my message is, Whatever you choose to heal in yourself sets up a resonance field for that healing to unfold in our world. So that truly your greatest service work in the world is being in service to your own healing first. So let's just imagine whatever you choose to heal. If you're a parent and you wanna be a better parent, imagine parents all over the world feeling a sense of inner safety parents all over the world who are healing their own trauma so they don't react badly to their own children uh, to the, so that they can create that safety. Uh, no matter what you are seeing in the world, I invite you, please, please move inside yourself and understand, work on your own healing first. And now imagine a world full of people who have that healing. It seems like a simple answer for a very complex and chaotic world but if we don't have that return to self we will continue to project all of our fears and lack of safety into the chaos in the world and i'm not saying that there's no chaos in the world and i'm not trying to do spiritual bypass but there's one thing you have choice over whether you go internal or whether you go external and go internal first to find that peace and safety, and then make a choice, a conscious choice about what will you do about this? How will you engage in your passions? Will you work in the school system? Will you work in the legal system? 
what do you choose to do, but to understand that you matter and we need every single person on the planet to, to, to get this work done and to get on the healing bandwagon. Because it heals the whole field. Exactly. Yeah. You have a statement in your book that um, emotion is the connective tissue of the field. I loved that. Yeah, that, you know, it, it jumped out at me. Emotion is the connective tissue of the field. And we are in a field together. And we are, as you say, you know, the ultimate reality is that we're all connected. The illusion is that we're separate. So we're connected by this field. So talk about emotion as the connective tissue of that field. Well, so uh, this this work that I received in meditation uh, after my near-death experience, I asked, well, what level of healing, what new level of healing can I bring to the world? And I received a formula. And I was like, a formula? What am I going to do with a formula? But the formula is really about transcending our egos, mm -hmm. which is really the, the ego keeps us in that sense of separation so that we can live in heart coherence, which uh, heart math, of course, and others are proving is a, a real resonance field. Um, and I think the greatest heart coherence field we can be in is gratitude, love, joy, and wonder. In order to be in those fields, you have to release your judgments and open to forgiveness, which is where the ego keeps us uh, blocked from being able to surrender to our divinity so that we can live in those spaces. And in those spaces of gratitude, love, joy, and wonder, grace drops in instantaneously, meaning miracles drop in. Miracles can simply be a shift in perspective. perspective. Uh, but it's about freeing ourselves from what keeps us in separation so that we can live in that heart coherence. That's really where the work is. And physiologically, I have these five stages of embodied grace, which show us how to move from one stage to another, from separation to synergy with surrender being the fulcrum. You know, we, it's all about getting to surrender. And I say, I mean, surrender to our divinity. and give up the egoic control to acknowledge what is and find safety in what is in the moment. And I know these are like sound bites in a short interview, uh, but yeah, that's, <laughs> I'll bookmark it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and Lori, we, we, you've brought up the, the, um, the, the word separation a few times. And, and in your book, you talk about the disease of separation and dismembered psyche. Um, could, could you say more on that? Well, I mean, let's just think about it in terms. So we start with, we, we're born with a, a sense of separation from the divine. And we're born to um, uh, parents who may not be fully equipped to give us that full safety. And, you know, uh, I used to joke about this, not really a joke, uh, that uh, I believe that 90, uh, we were told that 97% of us came from dysfunctional families. In in my decades on the planet, I've yet to meet anybody in the 3% category. You, either of you might be in one of the 3% category. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so with that, as an understanding, um, again, so when the pain of our feet, so we, we feel, all of us have this sense of separation and aloneness, whether it's in your in the schoolyard being bullied, whether even if it's tiny things, mom yelled at you and you didn't know how to, you know, respond to that. We carry, each of us carry what I call little T's and big T's, little traumas and big traumas. And um, it's in the it's in the healing of those traumas again where the seeds of our destiny emerge. The bottom line is look at what's happening around the world. We COVID had the opportunity for the first time in the in the planet's history to bring every person on the planet together through a shared separation experience. Now, like just wrap your mind around that <laughs> and I looked at the opportunity oh my gosh but what was the core issue everyone whatever you were experiencing whatever trauma you had before COVID 
simply got blown up uh, even more so, just like in these traumatized communities. Whatever trauma you already had was going to be exacerbated. And so um, it's a sense of how do we maintain that sense of belonging? Like the United States was founded on the sense of religious freedom, which will hopefully would give us all a sense of freedom and somewhat of belonging. Democracy is supposed to be about belonging. Our country is in a state of opportunity. We either find that sense of belonging or, or what do we do? Our hope, our desire, and I know that through your podcast, it's your desire as well, that when we see the commonalities, when we see what connects us versus what disconnects us, um, that's where solutions can happen. Now, there's a lot to be done to fix that, but it requires people to really hold a great deal of hope and resilience that miracles can come out of the chaos instead of the media and so many other things putting us into fear mode over and over and over again where we cannot find that physiological regulation. Well, you, you, if you wake up in the morning and you read the news or you have the news on all day, you're in a constant state, state of fear. I mean, unless you're listening to classical music. Uh, <laughs> so we have to really be diligent about what energetic information we're bringing in, what kind of energy we're putting ourselves into in terms of what's out there uh, to consume and to continue to remember what is it that I want most? What I wanted most when I was 12 years old was to uh, to to feel safe, to have uh, to have somebody love me, to have somebody rescue me, to know that I was loved. Um, and to have a hopeful, bright future. And isn't that what everybody wants? And no matter what person you see or what person might be your trigger in the media, um, it's an opportunity to really find some compassion that fear motivates negative behavior mm -hmm. and safe, uh, feeling unsafe motivates this negative behavior. So if I come back to myself and I realize, oh, you know, I understand what feeling fear and unsafety does to me. Let me work on myself first. Then I can discern. Doesn't mean that I'm I'm still not going to be angry with what's happening outside of me. But I, in a discerning place, I can respond more consciously from a place of choice to see what is it I want to do about this or how I want to contribute. Yes. Uh. Speak of the belonging and the need for that. And what I find when there's trauma that has dysregulated the nervous system is that people don't feel good about themselves. They have a lot of shame and they don't understand that the trauma created this dysfunction. They like the inability to speak up or the inability to be a success or to follow through or whatever it is that it's the trauma that affects that. And then they self judge and they have this sense of shame and it's very hard to have a sense of belonging when you're carrying shame. Right. Which again, it's hard to have belonging when you are traumatized and it is the dis dysregulation that creates the shame. It's the yeah. dysregulation that creates that negative thinking, those limiting beliefs. Um, and so it's so important. When I work in communities, I don't have I don't have a lot of time to do one on ones, although I do do one on ones. I work in groups. Groups are the most powerful opportunity. And I go right for it. What are you feeling right now? And and we list, you know, what are all the things that you're feeling? And people are just, oh my God, I didn't know you were feeling that way. Or I didn't know other people felt that way. And as soon as we just put it all up on the board. Whether it's people in Rwanda, whether it's service mental health professionals who are trying to serve people in these communities, identify um, what it is that you're feeling in a group setting 
And it's like, oh my God, that's so healing in itself. You are not alone. Every time we do that, we're emphasizing you're not alone. Uh, and so that's why I love group work um, so much. And I've seen it over and over again. I didn't know what I was dealing with the first time I went to Rwanda. But simply naming what is it that you want healing from. Nobody asked anybody that, you mm -hmm. know, uh, it's it was all about what we think you should be doing. And this is how it should be done and imposing a structure as opposed to partnering with people. And the greatest experience I ever had, what, and I realize we're getting to the top of the hour here, was being in Rwanda with a hundred orphan head of households. And uh, I, yeah, I had had a similar experience at the age of 12, left to care for an infant sister and three siblings. Now, nothing compared to my orphan head of households. Um, but I remember asking them uh, what it is they wanted healing from. And they named like many things, but they said healing from the wound of rape, healing from the hopelessness of not having parents, healing from poverty, healing from not having an education. That was on day two. <laughs> and I just remember surrendering to, okay, we're going in. And we chose to heal from the wound of rape first. Now, let me set this up. Um, I'm doing EFT here, and we don't have time to go into what that means, but um, we're doing a somatic release technique in which I we did a 30-minute protocol in which they went from high anxiety to uh, really what I didn't recognize until later was a piece, a, a sense of real peace and safety in their bodies. So at the end of this um, exercise that we did, we didn't heal the wound of rape, but we got them physiologically regulated enough so that in the weeks to come, we could deal with that. And, uh, and I remember there was a knock on the door. Now these kids don't eat, I have, I feed them. Um, and so there was a knock on the door and, and dinner was ready or lunch was ready, I'm sorry. And I fully expected the hundred kids to like just stampede to the lunch and they just wanted to sit there. And I, I was like, wow, they wanna sit here. So I said, do you wanna sit? So tell me what you're experiencing. And they, one by one, they told me that they were experiencing the sense of peace in their bodies that they'd never experienced in their entire lives and that's when I knew in 2007 that the somatic release work was the true healer um, and that we really needed this is what we needed to get the multitude of people to be healing from their trauma so that sense of safety and peace we all want that we all want it and if they could achieve it in a, you know, it doesn't mean that answers to their life were, were complete, but they had an experience that changed their lives. And that's the gift we want to give everyone, really. Yeah. Wow. That's profound. Well, Sorry. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned COVID before. I don't bring up a COVID relation question and safety in space. It seemed like at first, when in 2020, beginning of spring of 2020, the first couple of months, people were coming together in one way or another, knowing, hey, this is, we have to address this or or, or whatever, finding finding a way to deal with it. And then everything blew apart. And, and it just has gotten spiraling, spirally crazier by the, uh, by the day, a couple of years later. And, um, and it made me think, you know, you talk about 97%, maybe it's 100%, but 97% using your statistic of people with traumatic childhoods is, is, do you think, you know, this is a speculative question, but do you think the craziness that happened is almost like all this shock to the system of COVID and how it disrupted lives just like blew up that, and, and how could we heal that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, it's dysfunctional versus trauma. People will tell you they didn't have trauma in their childhood. I think everybody had a little trauma in their childhood. Um, 
But having said that, the answer is the same. The answer is uh, embodying your spiritual practices and continuing to find the safety inside and not let this noise, it's a lot of noise. Now we're, we're coming up with a resurgence and look, I'm not saying that people aren't in danger and that there isn't something important. We, we have responsibility for taking care of ourselves. Um, but as you say, Michael, you know, the first three months, great, everybody's doing good. Six months, but now it's two years. And then there's still now another resurgence. I ran a, a, um, a group for uh, a number of months at the beginning uh, for the first six months called Transforming Crisis into Miracles and Bringing What Matters into the Future with You. Uh, and again, we have to go back to that. Always, always, always. What is it? And the question that I ask in all of these communities is what is it that you want more than your grief and your trauma? Now, this is a heavy question, um, but it's important because most people's thinking is all about what's wrong and what's unsafe and what's fearful rather than what's right uh, or, or rather than what's possible and focusing on safety and peace inside. And that's what knocks us off our core uh, all the time and it's a it it requires a lot of conscious effort to continue in that space i know the three of us have devoted our lives to that conscious evolution um i for one still have to work diligently at it from time to time especially if i watch too much news <laughs> we are coming to the top of the hour and i just want to invite the listeners to um, put your questions in the q a or in the chat and we will read them. We'll take a little time for questions if some questions come in. Otherwise, we will go into wrapping it up pretty soon. But uh, if you have any questions for Lori about her work, about trauma, about her book, about anything she's talking about, about your own life, your own experience, um, now is the time. Yeah. So we have. But I can answer in one minute. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a question from Grace in the Q and A box, and she at Grace asked. How can we help people not be provoked and misled by social media? Um, that's a tough one because mm -hmm. there's a judgment involved there in the sense that, yes, we want everyone to not be triggered by that. I believe it's in our own countenance and our own approach. It's not about what we say to people. It's about what we exhibit in ourselves. And so when I'm getting embroiled in the middle of conversations with people, I just come back to, I really want to understand that more. Can you tell me more about that? Or, but it's my own peace and countenance about, well, you know what, what I really want is peace in the country. And, and also I want to be discerning in where I am getting my information from. And so I, I encourage people that I know well, are you getting information from multiple different places? I mean, are you being discerning? Are you just focused in on one thing? Um, but I would ask, really, the question is to look inside of yourself and what is, uh, is your urge coming from a place of being triggered or is it coming from a place of, uh, you know, true open heartedness and that's uh that can be tricky because I know I can get triggered. <laughs> You're like, what are you watching that stuff for? Um, but I have to then stop and go, wait a minute. I have to respect this other person and what their what their place is and where they're how they're being impacted by that. I know that's not a, a real concise answer, but um hopefully that makes some sense. Um, Terry says, I plan to get her book, but just wanted to thank Lori for the healing she has done in all these communities. God bless. Thank yes. you, Terry. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. And we, we had a comment earlier. Maybe it was when I asked my question about the psychology of the people who commit the atrocities, the shootings. But I was that uh, Grace said she thinks cruelty is pain waiting to be a, wanting to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's yeah. a really good point. 
-hmm. Yes. Yes. And if we all had a little more compassion for that, like if you go back to the beginning of these perpetrators lives, if there were more people who understood when they were children, when they were babies, when, when the trauma started to un unfold, the education, the mental health, the parents, the everybody who's involved, physicians, whatever, um, the legal system, if there was more understanding about the impact of trauma, we would come up with better solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about our future? We'll have this as perhaps a last question. Well, we do have another question in the Q&A box. Oh, okay. Well, let's take that first and yeah. then we'll end and give and, you a moment to think about, you know, yeah. what we're creating a, a positive future here. Yeah. Anne asked, how is addiction related to trauma? Uh, yeah. Well, just think about it. If you want to cover the pain of separation from the divine, if you want to cover the pain of what you're experiencing, um, we use food and, and thoughts and alcohol and substances. And we even use our uh, passions sometimes uh, as a balm to cover the trauma. And so the answer to what do I, how do I think the future can unfold? I, listen, I don't have a nonprofit corporation called Create Global Healing for nothing. Because I really do believe that we can do this in our lifetime if we do one thing, and that is to focus on our own healing first. And then just watch the ripple effects in your family, with your children, in your community, in your jobs, in the world. And there's so much more to talk about about this, but that's the answer. Focus on your own healing first, and I promise you, you are going to create ripple effects in the world that cannot be done uh, simply by talking about things or even volunteering for things. Marianne yeah. Woodman said wholeness is a powerful force all by itself. Yeah. Beautiful. So I, I had put in the chat box um, the link to getting your book and I mentioned that uh, people on September 14th, when your book is launched, people can get it, the digital version, right? For $1.99 at yes. the link. Um, it's well, if they go to the link now, um, then they're going to get um, information in the next week about live events I'll be doing on that day and also um, uh, the link to purchase the book for the $1.99. So if you go to that link now and let me know you're interested, um, then uh, um, I'll be in touch. Yeah. And I would, if I could, like to put out that at the end of October, October 21st to 25th, I'm doing a five day training in working with trauma called A New Lease on Life. Um, it is part of my immersion. It's five days outside of Asheville, North Carolina, and there's about three spaces left in the workshop. I limit it to 14 people. We really go deep in this workshop, and I just put that link up. Um, and I will, uh, yeah, oh, Louisa says, can't wait, she's registered. Thank you, Louisa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a five-day training in, you know, therapeutic treatment of trauma. And uh, just wanted people to know that since we're learning all about trauma here. Trauma healing, honey, trauma healing. Trauma healing, yes, that's right. <laughs> so um, we can go back to uh, Anna Day, you had asked Lori the question. Uh, which question did I ask? Oh, that was the future, I think. Ah, that was the future. Yeah, I think you sort of answered that. D did you answer the question that Michael had put out? Well, I asked, I had the question about addiction. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, well, so, yeah, I mean, healing trauma is essential to having a positive and healthy future. Otherwise, the trauma gets reperpetrated and it continues. Well, imagine Barbara's wheel of co-creation, and I can't recite all of the 12 areas, but we know it's legal, education, the arts, uh, mental health, whatever. Uh, imagine everyone involved in all of those fields working on their own healing first. Mm -hmm. We don't have to figure it out ourselves. Yeah. Because if once we heal in ourselves, 
and that those passions emerge and we align with people who have the same passions, we'll get it done. That's right. Beautiful message, beautiful message of hope. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Lori. And folks, get her book. It's really got some beautiful things in it, very nicely laid out, easy to read. Um, I'm, that was privileged to read over it, you know, since you sent it to me. And uh, really, your, your presentation of self is so pure and clean, and it's so obvious you've done your own healing, and you just sit there being a representation of everything you talk about. So it's really uh, so grateful that you were willing to make the time here to come on. And Michael, any last words from you? Oh, I, I just, uh, on, on, on top of what Anadea said, I just, I think it's just um, so amazing the work you've done. Not only, I mean, it's one thing to work with people one-on-one, -on -one, which, is, um, which is profound of and by itself, but to take that work, your work, and go to the communities that have been wounded severely and just just to help them heal um and and it's not that i'm sure you were there you were you had to be devastated yourself and in, in being empathic to their what they were going through and there was no easy answer is just to but to be with them be present with them and and help them through their their pain and trauma so sorry just um uh, blessings to you for for what you've done and what you will continue to do thank you and you know it makes my heart sing to be with both of you um and you know the work that we do together behind the scenes uh with evolutionary leaders um means the world to me and to have this kind of deep conversation uh is is even more meaningful so i so appreciate being able to kick off your year with this interview and i'm excited to share this with uh with lots of people oh great yeah thank you thank you thank you yeah so yeah All right. our next one will be on uh october 10th and it's with marilyn nyborg and uh gosh we i i forget what we're calling this one i haven't looked oh. yet <laughs> She's a feminist and uh, she's been, yeah, well, well, you'll get the, <laughs> yeah, um, we'll have more info. For you'll me. get all the information. She's really, uh, I've been delighted to know her and her work in over the years. And yes. All right. Good. Thank you so much. Thank all you. Right. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll be talking. Yeah. Okay. Thank Let's you, Lori. Go.